Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our inspiring content. Here is episode 143. From mentoring others, I've learned that we all have the same fears and doubts and needs, and we can all improve our results by improving our thoughts. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Bonnie Slaughter. Bonnie Slaughter has been a piano teacher for over 40 years. She is a nationally certified teacher of music. She's a member of the Idaho and Utah Music Teachers Associations. She has served as president of the Bridgeland and Ogden UMTA chapters, and hopefully she'll tell us a little more about that later. She has also served on the Utah MTA State Board. Bonnie is the director of the Oakwood Music Studio. She maintains a studio of about 100 students from newborns to adults. She has published five books, including Music Camp, which she also enjoys sharing with music teachers across the country. She's also created Theory Strips, a series of music theory workbooks to help students better understand and apply theory. She has recorded a series of audio CDs titled Surviving the Music Lesson Roller Coaster for Parents and Music Teachers and Thriving on the Music Lesson Roller Coaster for Music Students. She's now offering classes and personal mentoring to parents and music teachers where they learn tools to empower, inspire, and motivate their children and students. Bonnie is the founder and director of the North Cache Valley Performing Arts Festival, which was held in Preston, Idaho, each spring. The mission of the festival is to provide adjunction and performance opportunities for students of all musical genres and abilities. She is married and has five children and 19 grandchildren. Welcome, Bonnie. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here with you. I'm excited to hear about your music instruction and how you help others. But before we start with that, please tell our audience a little bit more about yourself. Well, like I said, I live in Preston, Idaho now. It's just a small town, but it's a great place to have a music studio. I feel like I have the cream of the crop. And I have the advantage of belonging to both the Idaho Music Teachers Association and the Utah Music Teachers Association. So I've got wonderful colleagues, and I really enjoy what I do. That's awesome. And then with the internet, too, she has a thriving online community, correct? Yes. In fact, I'm going to be doing some webinars. I, in fact, have been using YouTube with my students. I found that instead of me repeating myself, uh, I'll just say, here's the YouTube thing. Go watch this again and let you watch me tell you again what I've already told you. So it's kind of been really fun to take advantage of those tools. That's great. And so you can live in beautiful Preston, Idaho, but you can use the internet to grow your business. Great. That's right. And I do have my 20th grandchild coming uh, within the next month or two. So we're excited about that. That's really exciting. Yes. (laughs) Great. So tell me, what did your journey look like that led you to discover what you love to do? You know, how did you find your mission of teaching music? Well, I wasn't the best piano student, so I have to apologize to my teachers. (laughs) We all are there, right? (laughs) (laughs) But you know, that's good experience for us to help us relate to our students. But my mom kept me playing in church, which required me to practice and perform and to accompany. And those are major, just huge skills that I like to have to pass on to my students. And so, of course, when you play in public like that, it leads to people asking if I would teach their kids. And so now I've taught piano for over 40 years, and I just love seeing the progress of my students. I love the Music Teachers Association. My best friends are part of that association. And my education, we have monthly meetings and state and national conferences, and they're just amazing. I love learning. And earning my national certification was a major accomplishment and growing experience, not only for me, but for my students. 
That is great. And so tell me a little bit about the inspiration behind your mission and passion. I mean, you start out teaching and then that has turned into books and all kinds of wonderful videos and things like that. I mean, how has that grown? Right. I've spent a lot of years creating ways or looking for ways to solve problems that my students were having. And I think most teachers do that. How can I get this concept across? And so I've just had a passion for creating games and different ways to help my students learn. So that's why I created the summer camps, the music camp manuals for teachers. Usually they're like four days in a row for just one hour a day. But it creates a social network and social place for our students to get together with other students and learn, which is very motivating for them. Well, maybe that when they realize they're the only ones that don't enjoy practice. <laughs> exactly. It helps them feel a little more comfortable. <laughs> yes. You know, and doing things like even as simple as note names. When you have a game, you know, King of the Hill, and you've got two teams competing against each other, how much more fun is that than just sitting in front of someone and having them hold up a flashcard? So group classes are one of my passions because I think they're so effective in helping students retain and learn the information that they need. So you have 100 students in Preston. Do you have any, do you do online, you talked about doing webinars and stuff, but do you have a, an online community as well? Not yet. I do in-person presentations to teacher groups, and that's what I would like to move to the webinars Kind of focus uh, with the teachers and then they build their own community. Is that? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, and educating parents also. I'll tell you in a little while, that is another one of my passions that I discovered. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, tell us some of the challenges that you've had along the way and then what's helped you learn, what you've learned from those. Uh, I would imagine that that's a lot where some of your material comes from is those challenges. Yes. In fact, that's one of my biggest passions is what I've discovered in the last few years is how I can motivate my students because they learn best when they want to learn. Yeah. So I discovered that when students don't practice or, you know, this also applies to their doing their homework or chores or whatever, that there's a deeper reason. You know, it's not because they're just being lazy or don't want to. I found out that there's, there's some emotional blocks that I need to help them get over and that just causes breakthroughs. So when I first started teaching, so to speak, so like for the first 30 years, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I created a lot of games and motivational charts and different things, which I still use. But if they don't want to play, if they can't get themselves to the bench, none of those games are going to help. Yeah. So I have to address the root cause. And so I've recently discovered over the last three or four years some real breakthroughs, in my opinion, not only for me, but that I have shared with my students and their parents. So I found that they're being burdened with emotional reasons of why they're not practicing. That's interesting. And so I'll tell you about one of my first discoveries on this. So I learned about declarations and how important they are. So since I have a large studio, I have lots of guinea pigs. <laughs> So one student, I had a family where I was teaching four of the kids in the family. And one of them was a 14-year-old who really wanted to play but never practiced. I mean, like, never, never practiced. And so her mom decided that she would take her to another teacher who had lower expectations, and maybe that would help. And so they tried that for a year. Then they came back and said, okay, we just wasted a year of lessons. <laughs> but I had, you know, when they're about 14 or so, I consider them to be adults. And so I required the student to come and talk to me. And she said that she really wanted to learn how to play. She really, really wanted to learn. So I said, okay, I would take her back. And, you know, we went like six weeks. And again, she wasn't touching the piano. And so one day she walked in and she just said, I just need to tell you, I haven't touched the piano this week. And usually when that happens, I have them, we just go through their practicing their lesson to make sure they know how to practice because that's a big stopper for a lot of them. They kind of feel overwhelmed and don't know how to start. And so we usually just go through that. But this had been several weeks again. So I says, you know what? Sit down. We're going to do something else today. We're not going to play the piano. And so I asked her to write down for me on this piece of paper the top 10 negative things she heard in her head when it was time for her to practice. She knew she should be practicing, but she just 
didn't want to. What are the top 10 things going on in your head? And I thought, well, that's going to take her a minute to ponder, right? Yeah. Yeah, no. She just, I mean, she writes down those 10 things, like, very easily. No pondering needed. So I said, okay, so let's look at this list. Number one, I'm not good enough. It's like, holy cow. Wow. And I read through her whole list, and it was like, why try? I'm never going to make it anyway. It was all that kind of stuff. And so we took that list, and then on the, the we folded it down the middle, and on the other side, I had her write the exact opposite plus one more. So her first one, I am good enough, and I am beautiful. Oh, awesome. And we went through her whole list, and this is how I discovered that we need to write declarations. Then we take and we cut the paper in half. And then I asked her if she wanted to put the negatives through the shredder. And, you know, I was kind of surprised. You know, she's 14, you know, and things are kind of dumb, right? Yeah. <laughs> but no, she really wanted to do that. So we go into the office and she puts the negative list through the shredder. And she sat there and watched the whole thing go through. And it was like, turned on this light bulb inside of her. And then we typed up her positive statements, turned them into her declarations. Then I taught her how to stand tall and use her body language to really project those declarations. And it turned her around. Wow. In fact, after we went through them and, you know, I had to have her say them like five or six times because you have to say them big voice and powerful. You can't just whimper and whisper those declarations. You've got to convince your mind that they're true. And I said, do you think this will help you with practicing at all? And she says, you know, this will not only help me with practicing, but this will help me at school too. And we talked about how those negative voices are just unseen things. Yeah. She yeah. says, I want to tell you that those negative things are not just, I'm not hearing them in my mind. She goes, I have real people telling me those things every day. Wow. And I thought, how sad. But that was such a major turnaround for her that the very next week, she came in fully prepared, had a perfect lesson, and that has continued. Wow. That was um, really neat. I love your approach. Well, you know, and that's why I'm finding. So I thought, well, if it works for her, right? So we did it as a group class and individually, and every single one of my students now have declarations. And so when they walk in the door, if I can see their, their body language is kind of like down, first thing they do is stand tall and recite those declarations. So they have them memorized. It's on their assignment sheet. I expect them to do them every day. Wow. So you're not only helping them in their music studies. It sounds like you're helping them with their whole life. I mean, that's amazing. That, yeah, that's how it has turned out. So one really fun thing. So at the end of the year, that year, I decided, you know, I love these declarations. I We need to share them. And I was kind of wishy-washy on it because they're pretty personal because each person's declaration started with their negative thoughts. Yeah. And those are very uh, intimate thoughts that they yeah. have about themselves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it turned out being really fun. We went ahead and did it. But, you know, the parents knew, okay, here's where they came from as the, the opposites. And so as the students are reciting their declarations, your mind's kind of going, oh, where did that come from? Especially when they're doing things like, my mom is amazing. I listen to my mom. <laughs> You know, really, really funny. But it made such a difference in that recital. And afterwards, I had so many people say, you know, you always have great recitals, but this one just was extra special. And as I went back and pondered what was different, I realized that, you know, usually as the students are sitting there in line waiting for their time to play, it's just natural. All of us have going through our minds what we're going to do next. So instead of fretting about their songs, which were either ready or not, <laughs> the very first thing they were going to do, they were going to say their name, age, what they were playing, their composer, and then they recited their declarations. So what they had going through their mind the whole time they were waiting was their declarations. So they're going through their mind saying, I'm amazing. You know, I'm a fabulous pianist. People love hearing me play. And so that's what they're having going through their mind the whole time they're waiting their turn, just because that's what's natural for them to do when it's going to be the next thing they say. Wow. So yeah. it created such a phenomenal atmosphere in that studio that I've continued to do it. It's just, it's really amazing. We tweak their declarations because some things are issues and then they grow out of that and different things are issues. And so... It's kind of a live document. So we print them out on parchment paper and put them in the front of their binders where they keep their assignment sheets and 
it's part of their assignment sheet that I want them to do every day. Another thing that I found as I was working with them is I had the thought really strongly that I need to teach the parents. I need to teach the parents how to communicate and empower their children because I would see really sad examples. For example, I had two little boys who were doing fabulously well. They were winning competitions and doing really great And then one week they came and like they weren't prepared. You know, they had done some, but not much. The next week they came and they had practiced not at all. And finally, the third week, the mom confided in me that they had overheard dad say that playing the piano was for sissies and they should be out doing chores. Wow. And I have found from my 40 years of experience that parents don't even need to say things out loud, just the energy You know, especially if dad's resenting paying for lessons in any way, that energy carries over to the kids and it has a huge impact on them. So I discovered I need to teach the parents. So this one year, instead of piano lessons for the week, I had a parent meeting and we discussed different successful tools for motivating and helping their kids and what they should say. And we talked about Dr. Amoto's water experiments. I don't know if you've heard that or not. Oh, yeah. With the crystals. Is that- yeah, yes. And so if we are 70% water, what effect are your words having on your kids? So we talked about things like that. And the next week, I had one of my older students who was like a junior. In fact, she came in for a lesson. She sat down on the bench. She says, before we start, she says, I've got to thank you for that parents meeting. She said, my mom came home and apologized to me. That was a situation where that really needed to happen because this girl just struggled to have any support whatsoever. And so that led to the creation of the audio CD for parents to give them the tools to motivate and empower their children because obviously we need to hear something more than once. And so I wanted those parents to hear it over and over and over again and just remind them of the simple tools that they can use to help their kids. Yeah, I think sometimes when you are a parent and you're sending your child off to a teacher, you put all the responsibility on that teacher. But you as a parent really do have a a responsibility to be a great mentor to your children. I send my kids off to piano. I don't even play myself. I love the music that it's created in our home just by doing piano themselves. But if I send a bad message about it, (laughs) you know, it can have a really big impact on them. Yes. You know, and one of the most empowering things that you can do is to tell them that you just love hearing them play. Yeah. You don't have to play yourself in order to motivate and empower them. See, just your attitude right there speaks volumes of your children are going to do great because you value just hearing the music in your home. Yeah, but I love the idea. You know, I do have kids that don't love to practice. And now, you know, maybe it is things more than just that they don't like to practice or they're they're just I'll being resistant. It, right? Yeah, <laughs> that right. is great. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that kind of goes into how your paradigm changed over time and with experience. I mean, you started out just kind of teaching and right. now it sounds like you're really mentoring in other aspects. Tell us right. a little bit about that, how right. you feel like that's changed. Right. Well, um, I've gone out to and spoken to a lot of music teachers groups, and those presentations have led me to make the CD for the teachers, because from the teacher's perspective, you've got to have the right energy and information going forward also. And so that led me to also having a CD for the students, because my students were sharing so many success stories with me that I wanted to share that. That CD ends up being for kids by kids. So I invited my students to share their declarations and their little aha moments with other students. So that's what created the series of the Music Lesson Roller Coaster because it really is a roller coaster ride. You have your highs and lows. Uh, We all (laughs) do. And so that's what created that. But one of the big things, one of the challenges, you know, again, goes back to the, the students just not wanting to practice, but I have learned to never give up on a student. You never know when that light bulb is going to come on. And when it does, I tell you why, it's magic. In fact, I just had recently, I've got a girl who has had lessons for four years, never touched the piano except for here at the studio. And then all of a sudden, she comes one week and she's like, totally prepared, like, like every single song. And it's like, what happened? And she said, well, I just went home last week and just said to myself, I wonder what would happen if I did what Bonnie asked me to do. 
<laughs> and it's like she has been on fire for like the last oh it's been like september and it's just amazing so you just never know what's going to turn on that light bulb so i have and i've had it happen to me enough that i just never give up we just keep searching for tools and different things so i think my biggest paradigm change is that my students and their families are just they're not just learning to play the piano. I'm teaching them life lessons. And so it's my opportunity to help them grow and learn and succeed and share their talents and be successful in life. So I think that's my biggest paradigm change is it's not all about the piano. That's just a tool to use in helping them grow and succeed in their lives. Wow. And I really do love that idea. Just the idea that you're not going to give up on them. Just when they see that, that you're not going to give up on them, that really does create a different feeling in their life completely. Right. You know, just not in piano, but maybe you're the first person who has stuck with them and said, well, we'll try whatever it takes right. type of attitude. Right. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Looking for a motivating leadership experience for youth? Foundations of Liberty has been creating revolutionary leadership retreats since 2009. We work with awe-inspiring youth who are realizing and fulfilling their potential. This summer, there are two retreats in the Idaho Falls area. Each one is three days of powerful immersion experiences. Our website is wedevelopmoralleaders.com. One mom said, this has been a game changer for my daughter. A young man said, it taught me the importance of seeing potential rather than faults. These youth are not ashamed to admit that they want to be good and do good. More information at www.wedevelopmoralleaders.com. Welcome back to the Luminous Mind with Bonnie Slaughter, helping others thrive through the music lesson roller coaster. Love it. And I really, and I have found that they listen to other kids. Their peers are powerful. In fact, I have assistants, and my older kids are assistants. So while students are here, I have more than one here at a time. Maybe somebody needs help working on, you know, some part of their lesson. So I'll have an assistant work with them or whatever. But this girl that I was just telling you about who just came alive, I had her come and be an assistant this one day. The normal assistant couldn't be here. And I had another student, just a younger, so this student who had this breakthrough was like 13. And I have another student who's about nine who's having real issues of not wanting to do anything that her mom says, or if her mom wants it, she does not, regardless of what it is. So I had the 13-year-old listen to the 9-year-old play, and it was so funny because the 13-year-old comes back into the other room where I am, and she says, I just looked in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> Yeah, it solidifies when the students are teaching each other. It solidifies their own learning, correct? Yeah. So it was a win-win because she was able to communicate with the nine-year-old, I know how you feel. And the nine-year-old was able to see, oh, I see that I can change my outcome. It was just, it was very fun. I loved it. It was great. That is wonderful. I love your approach. It definitely changes their attitude for their whole life, not just for piano. Even though piano does, <laughs> it's one of those connecting skills that you have that connect into other academic situations. Yes. Well, but. Yes. You know, and it's one of the few things that you can take with you for your whole life. I think dance and sports and activities and all that are important. I have, you know, four boys and a girl who's also very sports minded. But you know, when you're my age, you're not so likely to be out batting a ball, but you do find great joy and pleasure in just sitting down to play. It can be a huge stress relief too. Yeah, so yes. It's a huge stress relief for me, even though I'm not, I don't play, but listening to my kids definitely right. <laughs> it makes right. a difference. So, so tell us a little bit about the services you offer and maybe some successes that you've seen. I love that you, you've you taken the passions that you have and are now turning around and helping other people. Right. Tell us about that. Okay, well, I said, so we have the roller coaster series, the music camp manuals. In fact, one of those manuals is based on the student 
CD. So during this four-day camp, which remembers just one hour a day, it gives detailed instructions on how to have your students write their own set of declarations and incorporates things, you know, different stories and activities for the kids to do during the week that incorporate those concepts, which can be very empowering. So that's really fun to have added that just this last year into my repertoire of things that I have. I also have things like, well, I've got a practice abacus. It's just a fun tool that the kids make to help them count their repetitions. So there's a a lot of fun things that we're putting out onto the website just tools to help them. And, and videos, too, because I actually yes. watched the practice <laughs> abacus. So. Did you? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, and just recently I've been incorporating, I've learned how to do the body code. I don't know if you're familiar with right. Dr. Bradley Nelson and the emotion code. No, I'm not. And the body code, it is going another level deeper of trying to remove those blocks. And so that's another thing that I've been using with my students and that I hope to expand to have clients that I can just work on with the body code and release those blocks. I've been doing it with my family, just friends and family right now, but they don't even have to be here. We do it proxy, so it can just be either over the phone or they just call and ask me. I'll have my kids say, I've got a pain in my ankle. Will you work on me? And so I will do the body code and emotion code to help them with that. That is wonderful. Yeah, that makes a big difference, I would imagine. It does. And, you know, just frustrations. I had one little boy just recently who was just really having kind of meltdowns. If he made the smallest mistake, he would just beat himself up over it. And so practicing at home with his mom was just drudgery because it was just this constant meltdown. If he played one wrong note, it was just, you know, taking him out. And come to find out he was being bullied at school and he was getting ready to perform a concerto. Well, in fact, he had performed this concerto in the fall, which is a like 26 page memorized piece with an accompaniment. And he was just really struggling just like last month and a half. And his mom asked me to do a body code on him. And so I did. We did two small sessions And we just came up with these negative emotions that he was harboring, that he wasn't good enough and things like that. And we released those emotions. And she just stopped by the other day to tell me what a difference it had made, not only in his life, but also his father's. So much so that instead of being bullied, he was running for class officer. Oh, wow. And she came by just this last Saturday to let me know that he won. Oh, wow. (laughs) <laughs> Rather than being bullied, he's now a class officer and his whole paradigm of life has just shifted and he's just doing fabulous. Well, and if you teach your students how to carry themselves, it will impact their rest of their life, right? They won't become the target for the bully. Exactly. They, yeah. Exactly. That's great. And do you have any other maybe testimonials of different things that you've produced that's helped people? I've got a whole binder I have <laughs> I, I, that's called my earn the right binder. But I get a lot of people telling me what a difference these things have made. So it's just an ongoing, it's very gratifying to have all the time. Yeah, especially when you have a love and passion that it's obviously coming through through you. <laughs> so, right, right. So, so tell me about mentors that you've had along the way that made a significant difference in your success and what you've learned from those mentors. Well, I've got to give my number one credit to Kirk Duncan. I don't know if you've heard of him and his company, Three Key Elements. Oh, we've talked about it a little bit on our show, but yeah. <laughs> he, yeah he totally has been my most influential mentor. He is the one who taught me about the declarations, about the negative voices that I was able to come home and apply with my students. He has totally changed my life and the way I teach and the way I share experiences with others. So Kirk for number one. And then the National Music Teachers Association. I have been a member of that association since 1994, and it has totally opened my eyes to uh, the bigger world of theory. I did. I had not learned theory before. I was really good at improvising, but I didn't know why. I didn't know how to teach it to my students because I would just have to sit down and to play, and I would just have to watch my left hand and see what it did and say, okay, copy it, but I didn't know why my left hand did what it did. And so now learning the theory has really opened up a whole new world. And the sight reading and ear training 
So those two, Kirk and the National Music Teachers Association, I think have had the biggest effect. And from mentoring others, I've learned that we all have the same fears and doubts and needs. And we can all improve our results by improving our thoughts. Yeah. That's and, really you know, and, yeah, everyone has something to share and we can learn from each other. I'm learning from my students all the time. Well, and I think that's really the key of being a mentor is that it's different than just being a teacher where you're spouting out information and expecting them to learn that you're really trying to find out who they are and help them in every facet of their life. Right. So. And, you know, and I think one of my rewards from that is when I have my students who have, you know, graduated and moved on and they'll send me an email about how they're teaching now or whatever, or I get these wonderful invitations to their uh, senior recitals from college, or, you know, they, they're opening their own studios, or they're performing at different things. That is huge for me that I've had an impact on their lives beyond just they're playing the piano. Yeah. Well, and you sound like a piano teacher that does expect, I mean, you have high expectations, but you're, sounds like your students are really meeting those just because of the, the value that they feel that you bring to their life, you know, that, right. that you really care about them. But. I hope so. <laughs> you know, awesome. So tell me about maybe books that you've read that you feel like have been really influential and in the ways that you've continued to increase your own education. Well, I'm a voracious reader. I've got a huge library and I've read everything from the seven habits to the jackrabbit factor to practice books by Philip Johnston and you name it. I love the self-help books. I, I love reading of what other people have done. I just have a whole list. I just love reading. <laughs> That's great. So what do you feel like some habits in your personal life that have been really helpful? Well, just don't give up. Keep pursuing answers. Don't be afraid to ask the questions and go search out the answers. Another one of my favorites is Three Feet from Gold. I don't know if you're familiar with that ah. book or not. But you know, just sometimes, you know, people like the students who aren't practicing or aren't making progress or whatever, or sometimes they even are. And all of a sudden the parents say, yeah, we're done. And it's like, oh, if you would just, just uh -huh. a little bit longer and you'd have your payoff, but they just, they quit. You know, I have students, I do a program called Let's Play Music by Shelley Solberg, which is a phenomenal program for children ages four to six. And it's such a dynamic way to give them a wonderful foundation in music for anything that they want to pursue. You know, the first year, they're not even on the keyboards or pianos. It addresses theory and pitch, the uh, rhythms, and all those things are introduced and through play. And it's amazing the results that we get when we put them on the keyboards. But, you know, they're required to do, like, listen to their CDs and play for, like, five minutes a day. And I have this one boy who is so, so talented, so gifted. He loves experimenting with sounds and things. And his mom came in the other day and says, this is just too intense. We're done. And he's not even going to finish the semester. And it's like, oh, please. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, this is, you know, for a six-year-old, you know, five minutes a day is too intense. Uh -huh. So anyway, just don't give up keep pursuing answers and just don't give up. Yeah, I think sometimes we do, we cut ourselves short and really stop the progression when we just decide that uh, we can't find the answer or we can't find the, you know, it doesn't come fast enough or something right. like that. So, And I think sometimes, you know, not everyone values music. Yeah. And you got to do where your passions are. And so finding value in what your kids want to do is important. Yeah. And the kid may love it, but the parent, you know, they, like you said, they don't see the value in it, then they'll pass that on to their kids through, right. through their actions and words. Right. And so they obviously lessons are going to last long when there's no support from home, which takes us back to the CD for parents. <laughs> so tell me, uh, what are your long term goals that are helping to work towards a legacy? You know, let's talk about a little of that. Okay. Well, I think, you know, I just, I so want to inspire and motivate parents and music students and their teachers because there is such a decline in the number of people who can play. Uh, you know, it takes work. And it just seems like nowadays they don't want to do things that take work. 
Uh, I have a lot of parents, the paradigm is, you know, I want to just like take them to dance, drop them off, be done, not have to do anything else with them. And so I really want to motivate the parents and increase the number of students who are learning to play instead of watching it just decrease. So a really out there, great big goal. I want 10,000 people around the world to listen to my CDs and apply the concepts. How's that for a great big long term? <laughs> that would be wonderful. Well, hopefully this podcast will help with that. So. <laughs> and the legacy, I guess, of course, is to be an inspiring mentor to other teachers or parents or uh, students. And, I'm, I mean, what, yes. what do you feel? What's your legacy? Yes. All of them. I think my greatest joy is just hearing those that I've taught play the piano or organ and sharing their talents, you know, whether it's my own kids, my grandkids, or just, my, you know, just my students. I just love hearing them play. And it just never gets old. Yeah, it's definitely when uh, you've put the work in as a parent and you hear your kids play, it's a heartwarming thing, you know, that it you is. can, no amount of money can beat that. So exactly. Great. In fact, you know, my mother in law passed away last fall. And it was so gratifying that in a short term, so you have three days or whatever to plan a funeral, that we could call upon my my children and my grandchildren to perform musical numbers. You know, here's a piece that grandma liked. Can you learn this? And have them be able to pick up a piece of music and learn it and perform it in three days is yeah. very gratifying. Yeah, for a tribute to somebody that you love, too. Yes, so. Oh, how wonderful. So before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words of advice for our listeners? And then give us your contact information of how we can connect with you. Okay. So my parting advice is to just don't get so caught up in the everyday grind and list of to-dos that you forget to enjoy the journey. Enjoy the process. Enjoy and celebrate the small successes, whatever they might be. And they can just be very small. Just enjoy and celebrate. And my contact information, my website is oakwood.musicteachershelper.com. And my email is, it can be bonnie at utahmta.org. Or also bmusic at ida, I-D-A, dot net. And I would love to hear from people. They can order CDs and camps and everything, practice abacuses, theory strips, whatever, from my website. So I'd love to hear from some people. Oh, well, great. Well, we will be sure to connect all your information on the website for our listeners to find as well. And it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you this morning. Thank you so much for helping to light our minds on fire. Well, thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Bonnie Slaughter, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our new monthly newsletter. Then check out our services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of inspiring content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net. For more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 